Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Coffee Chatter. Actually, it's afternoon, but you get the idea. There has been a lot of sadness in the news lately. First off, last week, a major explosion rocked a Manhattan community in New York. While at first people suspected terrorism as the possible cause, the actual cause of the explosion was a gas line that was improperly reinstalled. On Sunday, two bodies were found buried in the rubble. Also, just a week before, a Brooklyn Jewish community lost seven innocent children in a fire. Only the mother and a teenage daughter were able to get out of the house. And closer to home, the community of Bedford, New Hampshire is currently experiencing a devastating tragedy. A young woman named Nina shot and killed her two daughters, aged eight and six, and then killed herself. The husband came home to find his wife dead, and it wasn't until authorities arrived and examined the rest of the house in the upscale community that they found the two deceased daughters. No, one, no suspects are being sought, and many believe that Nina had depression as she called her lawyers frantically Saturday night before her husband arrived home to find her deceased. However, they are now unable to contact the husband with any further investigations because he has disappeared. But it has been ruled out that he is the one who shot them, as the mother had the, the gunpowder on her hands and proved that she is the one that did it. Also, as I am recording this show, there is a fire on Harvard Street in Boston, and Boston PD has been called into the house. And also, a former firefighter is holding, or was holding, hot firefighters hostage at the basement of their own fire station in Chatham, Pennsylvania. Chattenham, sorry, and um, I have just received word that that is now under control and the suspect is in custody, so that's a good thing. Let's lighten things up with Dancing with the Stars Latin Night. The elimination wasn't quite as shocking this week, but the, the dances were. Those not so good last week did well, and those that shined last week fell a bit. There's a tie for first this week as well, so let's get to the recap. Kicking off the evening was Rumor and Val with a salsa. It had great energy and a great combination of salsa and disco, as their assigned song was disco-themed. They earned a score of 33, increasing one point from last week, placing them in a solid second. Charlotte and Keo danced the rumba, and she really did well this week, with the exception of she was not focused 100% during rehearsals. She claimed she was really busy with potential job offers, but the way Keo and the judges said it is true, and I agree with them. This, Dancing with the Stars, is Charlotte's job right now, and she, should, she is getting paid, and quite well, I may add, to do this every week. So this should have been her primary focus. She shouldn't be looking for other jobs, because for the next 10 weeks, or in her case, three, but she didn't know that at the time, for the next 10 weeks, we'll put that for all the stars, not just her, but I'm just saying in a general sense, once you sign up to do Dancing with the Stars, you, that should be your primary focus for 10 weeks. I mean, unless, of course, you're a mom and, a, you know, you have school like Willow and stuff like that. That's different. But in her case, she shouldn't be looking for a job to do while she's dancing if she can help it because she's getting paid quite a bit of money to show up every Monday night. It was a good dance overall, but she did not stick her feet correctly during the dragging moves that come with a rumba. So it almost looked like she was fighting the dance off. Their score was a 22, a four-point drop from last week. They were also the eliminated couple this week. So those that were sick of seeing her boobs can rest easily now. They won't be seen until the finale. Michael and Peta were up next with a salsa. It was a great dance that was a lot of fun to watch, but he did lose timing in a few spots. Just a note of enthusiasm, timing is very important in the Latin dances because they move so quickly. If you listen to salsa music or samba music, it's very quick and it's usually Spanish, which is fast to begin with. Their score was a 24. They dropped four points as well. Riker and Allison moved themselves to the top spot on the leaderboard with their creative modern salsa, and it was rockin' hot. Their score was a 34, increasing by two points. Suzanne and Tony did a very fruity samba to, you guessed it, the Copacabana. 
complete with the fruit hat. It was a great dance with lots of energy and fun. Their score did drop three points, though, giving them a 25. Chris and Whitney were in jeopardy and part of the bottom two, saved only by Charlotte being eliminated. Chris and Whitney did an amazing Argentine tango. He hesitated a bit in one spot, but overall it was a great dance. He came back with a vengeance after last week, earning a 28, jumping up by 7. Robert and Kim also shined really well in La Rumba, where we saw the shark in a vulnerable position. Fellow sharks Lori Grenier and Kevin O'Reilly, or at least I think that's his name, were in the audience to cheer him on. It was a beautiful dance, earning them a 29, they increased by 1, which means they are steadily climbing. Patty and Artem continued to impress and inspire with their cha-cha, which was fun and offered basic technique, although Bruno and Len called out Artem for more choreography. For someone who's 70, she moves pretty well. Their score did go down to a 22, losing 6 points from last week putting them in a vulnerable position for next week's elimination. Willow and Mark danced the first pas de doble of the season, in which we saw a new side of Willow, despite a seemingly dangerous rib injury during rehearsals. Their score was a 32, one of the only teams to stay the same this, as last week. Noah and Sharner were also surprisingly in jeopardy, but were the first to be deemed safe on the boardwalk. They danced an Argentine tango. It was a beautiful dance that continues to inspire us to think outside the box. This was the first dance that they did in hold position, which is your classic ballroom position, which, as you can imagine, is challenging without an arm. They attempted a prosthetic, but Noah did not feel comfortable with it, so they rearranged the choreography. They earned a solid 30, increasing by 3. Nastia and Derek ended the night and co-wed with Riker, earning the same score of 34. They danced a samba, which surprisingly came out great, considering they both had tough schedules. She overextended a few of her moves, which Carrie Ann pointed out, but I didn't see much of a problem. They also stayed the same from last week. So a quick recap, eliminated couple with Charlotte and Keo. They did not announce a theme for next week, but I might guess it would be Personal Stories Week, as they usually do that about week four or five. Our cold case section this week is from Maryland. David Bell was found stabbed to death in his residence in the 300 block of Chesapeake Avenue in Christfield, Somerset County, Maryland, on February 27th of 1997. David Bell owned several properties in the area, and robbery may have been a motive for the murder. You can contact the Maryland State Police Homicide Department, and when referring to this case, use case number C9501124. While I haven't been doing much in the movie, TV, or book review section, I did try a new restaurant this week, thanks to my neighbor Megan. Although this is considered a chain restaurant, meaning it can be found anywhere in the United States, this was my first time visiting Red Robin. They have tons of burgers, from traditional to vegan to garden to even an open-faced chili burger. For those of you not into burgers, they do have wraps and salads as well. Although I was tempted to try the chili burger, I kept it basic and got a basic burger. It's cooked great and they have a wide variety of cheeses to add to your burgers, which not a lot of restaurants offer more than the typical American cheddar and occasionally you'll find someplace with Swiss. Their french fries are delicious and bottomless, which is quite literal actually, like you pick up the thing that they put them in and there's a hole at the bottom of the thing, which means, you know, as long as you want french fries, you can get endless french fries. Their dessert menu is small but impressive. Overall, a great place to eat once your name is called. If it's a freestanding Red Robin somewhere on its own, like, you know, they just opened up a Red Robin in, a, in an empty lot, you probably won't have a long wait. But ours is part of the mall in New Hampshire, so it gets pretty busy. 
her reflection corner as we get closer and closer to the end of Holy Week. Our first reading is Isaiah 49, 1-6. through 6. Hear me, O coastlands. Listen, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb he gave me my name. He made of me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arm. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me. You are my servant, he said to me, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Though I thought I had toiled in vain and for nothing, uselessly spent my strength, yet my reward is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Our psalm is Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6, 15, and 17. In you, Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue and deliver me. Listen to me and save me. Be my rock and refuge, my secure stronghold, for you are my rock and fortress. My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked, from the clutches of the violent. You are my hope, Lord, my trust, God, from my youth. On you I depend since birth. From my mother's womb you are my strength. My hope in you never wavers. My mouth shall proclaim your just deeds, day after day your acts of deliverance, though I cannot number them all. God, you have taught me from my youth. To this day I proclaim your wondrous deeds. And our gospel message, as usual during this time of the year, is John 13, verses 21 to 33 and 36 to 38. When he had said this, Jesus was greatly troubled and testified, Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, at a loss to whom he meant. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant. He leaned back against Jesus' chest and said to him, Master, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I hand the morsel after I have dipped it. So he dipped the morsel and took it and handed it to Judas son of Simon the Iscariot. After he took the morsel, Satan entered him. So Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now none of those reclining at table realized why he had said this to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bags, Jesus had told him, Buy what we need for the feast, or to give something to the poor. So he took the morsel and left at once. And it was night. When he had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I told the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say it to you. Simon Peter said to him, Master, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, though you will follow later. Peter said to him, Master, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Amen, amen, I say to you, the cock will crow before you deny me three times as our reflection for this week. As we draw close to Good Friday, we journey with Jesus to the cross. Today's gospel focuses on the betrayal of Jesus, something not only his disciple Judas did, but also something we do through our sins. Each time we knowingly commit a sin, meaning we know something we are about to do is wrong, and we still do it anyway, we are turning our back on him. And it probably happens way more than three times. And chances are, there is no crow to remind us. 
That is why we need to tap into our spiritual life a bit more. I say spiritual because although I'm Catholic, I respect the fact that others may not be. Everyone, regardless of faith or even lack of, has a conscience. A little voice in their head that points to them that this is wrong. We need to pay more attention to that voice. Pretend that the voice is the crow if you need some form of visual. Keep returning to any of the Gospels that speak of the betrayal. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Will doing this action or saying this word or thinking this action dig the nails deeper into his skin? We have two saints today. The first is Saint Benjamin. What I like about, before we start reading about Benjamin, one of the things I like about the saints during Lent is that I actually celebrate them on my show because especially during Holy Week a lot of the saints these days get trumped or knocked out of view because of Holy Week services. So doing my show gives you a chance to at least for one day out of the week know who the saint of the day is. And in this case we have two. Starting us off is St. Benjamin. Benjamin was a deacon. Benjamin was martyred during the Christian persecutions in Persia under King Isdegard. The anti-Christian campaign brought to a close at 12-year at 12 period of religious tolerance that the king himself had initiated. He had put an end to the years of cruel treatment Christians suffered during the reign of his father, King Sapor. All that changed, however, when a bishop named Ab Abdus, in his zeal to rid Persia of idol worship, burned down the pagan temple of fire. Incensed, Isdegerd threatened to do the same to the Christian churches unless the bishop rebuilt the temple. When Abdias, Abdias refused, he was executed. Churches were burned and Christians tortured in horrible ways. Isdegerd died in 421, but the cruelty continued under the reign of his son Varanus. Deacon Benjamin was among those who suffered. He was imprisoned for a year for practicing his faith and endured countless tortures. The Emperor of Constantinople succeeded in securing Benjamin's release by promising Varanus that once free, the deacon would not return to preaching. It was a pledge that Benjamin could not honor. Almost immediately, Benjamin took to the streets and began preaching openly wherever there were people to teach. In 424, Benjamin was arrested again and brought before the king. Again, he was beaten and tortured, but he refused to be silenced, declaring his allegiance to God and his duty to preach the gospel. The king then instructed his jailers to torture the deacon until death. Benjamin died in terrible agony. Today we also celebrate St. Guy of Pomposa. Guy was an abbot from Italy. Born near Ravenna, Guy was the oldest child in his family. His parents bought him fine clothes and gave him the best education. When it was time for him to marry, they even chose a bride. But Guy had other plans. He decided to present his father with a riddle. Suppose he had to choose between two women, Guy said. One woman was beautiful, but so demanding that a husband would have to pay a high price to endear himself to her. The other was less attractive, but easy to please. Which woman should he, should he marry? His father told him the beautiful one. Guy replied that the beautiful and demanding one represented the gospel of Jesus. Guy sold his expensive clothes, gave his money to the poor, and set out for Rome, where he was admitted to the clergy. Guy returned to Ravenna and submitted to the guidance of a hermit named Martin. The two lived on an island in the Po River for three years. Afterward, Martin placed Guy in charge of the Abbey of St. Severus and later of Pomposa. The Archbishop of Ravenna, for unknown reasons, decided to attack and destroy the Abbey of Pomposa. Although he knew about the Archbishop's intent, Guy warmly greeted the Archbishop and his soldiers. The archbishop was so moved that he apologized for his intent to harm the monastery. Guy was so famous for his holiness that even after he retired to a hermitage, the emperor sought his counsel. 
Reluctantly, Guy left his community to meet the ruler, telling them he would see them no more. During the trip, Guy suddenly became ill and died three days later. Our closing prayer, Lord, we come to you today to pray for our church leaders. For it is through their enduring faith that the truth of your son Jesus is known around the world. Bless them with the wisdom to encourage the faithful and to teach those who doubt your word. Watch over those who have answered your call to minister in places where there is danger and persecution. Protect them from those who seek to extinguish the light of your flame so that all may come to know you. Amen. And this week's weekly prayer intentions. For all those sick and suffering in any way, those who are scared or afraid, and those who are alone. Most importantly, those who feel forgotten and have nobody to pray for them. For all those around the country and the world entering the Catholic faith this coming Easter Vigil, as well as those being baptized into the Christian faith during this Easter season. This week's fan of the week is Laura Cromlin. The correct answer was Dave Barry. And the first half of the prayer this week is also supplied by Laura, as that is her personal intention for the week. And I will see you next week and hope everybody has a happy and joyous Easter.